everything and welcome to the Case Filters social channels. We have got half an hour coming up uh, talking about the new Case Filter system, one of the new Case yeah, Filter yeah, systems. Yeah. Let me just turn that off. Um, and my name is Ruth. If you haven't joined us before on any of these, I tend to host these in Path of Case, chatting uh, generally to some of Case's ambassadors. Tonight, uh, theoretically, we've got two. I was just saying this to Adam earlier. Adam's going to have to talk. I don't know. What's better, Adam? Do you want to talk half the speed or twice yeah. as much? No, I'll just talk half the speed. <laughs> half the speed. So it's not it's not your setting. So it's us going very slowly. Adam Gibbs is with me, a uh, Canadian landscape photographer. And we should have Nigel dancing here as well. Nigel, uh, I'm going to say running late. If he comes in, he comes in and uh, we'll jump onto that as well. But Adam and Nigel uh, have worked together uh, as far as I'm aware. I'll introduce you to them in just uh, a couple of minutes time. But if you've joined us for the first time, like you say, uh, whether on YouTube or on Facebook, there is a live chat facility on there. Do feel free to use that if you want to ask any questions uh, throughout the next 25 minutes or so. They will come into us in the back end. There is a wee bit of a delay on that, maybe 10 seconds or so. So just give us a bit of time. Uh, for that to come back to us. But do let us know where you're tuning in from. That would be cool. If you've got any questions specifically about the kit, feel free to fire them in. If Adam can't answer, I definitely can't, but uh, we will make sure that the guys at Case and the gal um, will get hold of that and we'll do what we can for you. So as I said, we are here to talk about one of the new filter systems, but just first of all, for those of you perhaps Adam, who do not know you. I've not actually chatted with Adam before. Um, Adam, just tell us a wee bit about yourself. First of all, you're 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 English. I know this, but you live in Canada. So let us know what happened there and how did that have come about? Uh, well, I well I moved to Canada in 1979. So I've been here for a long time. Moved here with my mum and dad, mm -hmm. and uh, I for some reason I kept my English accent somewhat. Um, and then in I guess in 86, I moved out to British Columbia. I lived on, I lived central Canada, Ontario. And then 86, I moved to British Columbia, mostly for rock climbing. And uh, I've been here ever since. And the last three years, I guess, I moved to Vancouver Island. Uh, my, my parents actually live next door, which is handy in some ways and not so handy <laughs> in other ways. Um, and uh, during COVID, I because I, I have the YouTube channel, I just needed to be able to have access to wilderness areas quickly out my door. So I guess, uh, you know, Vancouver Island was the place to come. And luckily my partner and I, we, we own a house here. So I just moved into the house and uh, the rest is, is kind of history. Uh, I've been a photographer for um, since 1992. I used to photograph mostly editorial for gar gardening magazines. I did that for 20 odd years. Wow. And then um, I guess, about five or six years ago, the bottom fell out of the, the magazine industry. Mm. So I was left without a job. So that's when I started up the YouTube channel, which was probably the best thing that I ever did for photography, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Vancouver Island, I guess, it's kind of like I'm from the west coast of Scotland. We were chatting about this earlier in terms of, you know, people love to go there for tourism. Sky, obviously, is really, really well known from a photography point of view. Vancouver Island, not quite so much, but is it to you in your eyes? Is it kind of like a hidden gem? Is there lots of potential there? Are you trying to keep it quiet, or is what's that like? Uh, well, it's not a hidden gem anymore. Uh, there's a lot of people moving here. Uh, I live in a, a relatively small town called Parksville, and the average age is 62. So mm -hmm. you can see that most people that are moving here are retiring. Um, it's definitely the, during the summer. There's a lot of tourism here. Um, it's not a great place for photography in the summer, uh, probably because of the uh, the weather that we've been having. Uh, it's, the last few years, it's been very hot and sunny for it'll be for for weeks and weeks, and uh, a lot of the streams and the, the waterfalls dry up, and uh, the forests don't look so great. So, to, photography wise, it's not great in the summer, but in the winter and the spring and fall, it's amazing. Um, and there's a there's you know, it's kind of like Sky. There's the popular areas that are very easy to get to that most photographers go to, but there are a lot of hidden gems that obviously mm -hmm. are harder to get to, which aren't quite as popular. But to be honest with you, I mean, I all the times I'm out, I'm out a lot. I hardly ever see any other photographers, hardly ever. So it's so far, it's been great. So far, I mean, keep 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 the locations to yourself. I've seen some beautiful pictures actually. You've done, you know, even in caves, things like that, which. 
obviously I've never been there, but I imagine fairly hard to identify unless unless you know where to go, which is maybe the mistake uh, the West Coast has made. But a stunning looking place. And I will say you have got a little bit of an accent. It, it trips off on certain words, but I imagine that's uh, part of the Yeah, course. well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm from the South. So, uh, the South. Yeah, I, I was actually grew up in um, Bletchley, uh, Milton Keynes, not okay. far from London. Yeah, mm. not an inspiring place for photography. That's, that's all right. Up. You're in, you're in a good place now. You're in a good place now. I was going to, um, uh, planning chatting obviously to Nigel about this as well, but last time I chatted to Nigel, and for anybody who hasn't seen that, if you want to go back and check it out on the Case channel, uh, a whole bunch of interviews there. But last time I spoke to Nigel, he was about to head out to Antarctica, which isn't something that you say every day. And I guess, I don't know if it is a dream or not for a lot of landscape photographers. It certainly seems one of the more perhaps unachievable um end of the landscape photography spectrum but adam you went out as well i think didn't you there was a group of you that went out there yes i was very fortunate to to go out on that trip and actually it's it that's my second trip to antarctica oh, not so unachievable um, then yeah. well I, I went out there in 2008 uh we actually went to the falkland islands and then south georgia island which are still owned by the by the U, still part of the uk and uh, and then we just did a little bit of Antarctica itself, uh, but this trip, this more recent trip, was just Antarctica, the the peninsula of Antarctica, and it's absolutely stunning down there. Um, it is definitely a once in a lifetime trip because of the expense of getting down there, but uh, I highly recommend it. Um, there are a number of people that are opposed to tourism down there. Um, and you know because of the the carbon footprint and that mm. kind of stuff but um i personally i think that the only way you can really identify with these places is actually going to them and, and seeing what's down there and uh if you have an opportunity i would highly recommend it actually we're, we're going back again uh, in 2024 uh we have a group we have a whole boat going down with us oh, so amazing. yeah it's going to be it's just an epic epic place to go so you mean, obviously, regret. yeah. I mean, if the chance ever ever comes up, absolutely. You obviously go on a boat. You're saying there's people that are, you know, against the carbon footprint, things like that. I'm guessing most things are going to confine to the big boat, the small boat, and maybe some landings. If you've got a group of people, obviously you've got a, a group of pro photographers. Do you find that you come away with the same kind of stuff, or is it quite interesting to maybe see how different people see um, different things and come away with different photographs? No, I think I mean obviously there's there's familiar fam familiarities between images because you're in the same location, same mountains and such. But no, uh, it's amazing what people come away with. And of course, some people are more into the wildlife, um, mm -hmm. and then other people are into more into the the landscape. Um, there there are the there are some really strict uh, the the restrictions when you go on the land are, are quite intense um you it, you can't it's just not it's not a, just a free-for-all for everybody um there's only so many people allowed per landing uh the when you get on and off the boat you have to uh, wash your uh, boots in a solution so you're not contaminating the land i mean it's oh. um the restrictions are, are pretty harsh and you can't just go wandering anywhere also, the landings are very far and few between because most of it down there is ice. So there's only very s small areas where there's actually land where you can get off a boat because most of it's glaciers. And most of those areas tend to be um, research stations that have already been established down there by other countries because there's, there's research stations everywhere from, say, Russia, uh, Chile, Argentina, the UK. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different research stations and that's where the landings tend to be mm. and that oh, that's also where the penguin colonies tend to be is because the, the penguins don't nest on ice they they nest on dry land so that's where you go so the spots that you can get to full of uh, full of penguins and full of penguin poo i imagine yeah you can uh yeah you really recognize the smell miles away before <laughs> you land <laughs> it's quite intense. smell the landing spot before there's <laughs> before can. land ahoy <laughs> so i mean yeah. obviously antarctica i imagine a fairly tricky place there's a lot of uh lots of big expanses of white lots of water around glare things like that tricky conditions for taking photographs in when it comes to filters i'm guessing this was a pretty essential part of your kit for down there uh yeah i mean 
pretty much the only the only filter I really used down there actually was a polarizer, um, okay. and that's just to get rid of glare. The the thing with the ND filters, um, you couldn't really use them because you're on you're on you're moving all the time. You're on either a a, a, a small boat or on the large boat, and of course you're always moving. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to do anything with a very long shutter speed, it was pretty hard to do because you just you know not stable at any time. So I I. I didn't use the NDs very often, but the polarizer I used quite often, um, especially for glare on this on the ocean, and sometimes you get glare on icebergs and such. So it's a very handy filter to have for sure. Mm. So you couldn't obviously land, set off, do your own thing. It was more a case of you know as and when you could snap stuff. Did you take a tripod along? Is that something that just wasn't part of the picture? Um, I did bring a tripod, uh, but. I would say that 80% of my images were handheld, um, probably because when well, you're shooting into very bright areas, so mm -hmm. the, your shutter speeds are generally quite high anyway. So you could handhold pretty much everything. A tripod was really just to hold your camera while you're not while you're not holding it. You know, <laughs> it's just a place yeah, to put yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're in Canada, winter in Canada, uh, you know, very spectacular generally. I'm guessing it's maybe the same on the West Coast as well. Did you learn anything or did you learn anything in Canada that was useful perhaps for being down there or vice versa when you were down in Antarctica in terms of kind of shooting in those conditions? Is there anything that kind of translates back and forth that might be handy for uh, people doing their own kind of winter shooting? Um well, not not really. Actually, where I where I live, it's actually quite temperate. We we very rarely get snow. <laughs> we, okay, we right. Little, okay. We, had a, we had a little bit. Of, that's why everybody wants to live here because it's probably the warmest place in Canada. Uh, if I drive an hour north, then they they'll get quite a bit of snow. Uh, but uh, where we are, um, it generally just rains a lot, and it's very much like Scotland, actually. I, yeah, feel you. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of I used to do a lot of when I lived in on, on Vancouver. There's right in the city of Vancouver. There's actually three ski areas right in town, and I used to go up to those areas a lot because it would be great because it'd be pour, pouring with rain in Vancouver. But of course, as soon as you got into the mountains, it, it, there would be a snowstorm, and uh, it was great because I was able to just kind of predict when the weather was going to be really good up there. So after a snowstorm, if it was clear, I'd, I'd run up to one of the local mountains. And it would just be a, a winter wonderland up there because you get this really wet snow clinging to all the all the trees up there. And um, so I, I did that for quite a few years. Uh, and I, I learned that uh, at that time I was shooting film. Uh, all you had to do is overexpose the film by by one stop and you'd get perfect exposures every time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, with digital, it's a little different. Uh, I tend to. Uh, exposed for the highlights so often my images will be slightly underexposed uh, which is quite a bit different than film mm. just because I don't want to blow out those those highlights you know yeah yeah so you had um, the ideal situation going on there you could commute commute an hour you know get the conditions that were pretty epic and then head back to slightly warmer climbs yeah, and 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 even better, they actually had a webcam up there because it's a ski <laughs> area. So you could just look at the webcam and go, "Okay, looks good," and then just drive on up. You know, um, fantastic technology. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I, and it ski areas are great because um, even though I didn't use the lifts, I would I would either ski up or or snowshoe up to the summit of the of this one particular area I went to, Mount Seymour, all the time. Uh, it would take me about an hour, an hour and a half to get to the summit. So I could get up there by sunrise and you just get this spectacular scenery because north of Vancouver, uh, it's all wilderness. So you you have the Coast Mountains and it, they, the Coast Mountains go all the way up to Alaska, which is thousands of kilometers away with the odd town thrown in in between. But it's just mountains, a sea of mountains from from North Vancouver all the way all the way north. So the scenery is spectacular. Mm. Um, so having something so close to a major city is is really nice. Mm. Uh, but of course, this was a few years ago. Um, it's changed a lot since I was going up there. Of course, now more and more people are in the back country. So it's it's very hard to get up there and, and not have snow that isn't pristine. It's been tracked out or um, there's a lot of people in the way. So it's a bit harder to get the photographs that you want. But there's still a good place to go up to mm. and, uh, you know, encounter a little bit of wilderness in the city. 
sure. still still exists up there. Gary's just asking in the chat, just jumping back a little bit. We mentioned that you moved to Canada when you were younger. I think you were you're about fifteen. But you say, have you always been a photographer, or did you have a different career uh, before before? No, I I actually taught rock climbing for about ten years. Um, that's all I did. I, I was pretty much a rock climbing bum, um, <laughs> and I I got into photography. Um, more or less, I, I I fell out of climbing because I it's kind of like anything you you turn a hobby into a profession and all of a sudden it's not as fun as anymore and you just kind of get tired of doing it. Mm. So I I was kind of umming and ahhing. Well, what am I going to do next? And that's when I decided to uh, take up photography more seriously. So I, I went back to school. I went to college. Uh, I took a two year photography program in Vancouver, and um, with with the intent of working in a studio as a product photographer. And um, I worked in a studio for about two weeks and I said, this isn't for me, this is no, <laughs> no way. No, thank I'm, you. No, because all those guys did was just complain about how much money they weren't making. And I just thought, oh, why would I want to work in this industry? <laughs> so. I, I imagine it's slightly soul destroying. In fact, I imagine now there's possibly computers just, you know, doing that is the kind of thing that you can imagine technology would uh, take over, but perhaps not. I think for outdoor lovers, it'd be something that would not really, uh, not really feed into your soul, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, photography has changed so much over the years. It used to be that I would make a living out of selling the rights to uh, photographs, but I don't think I've sold the rights mm -hmm. to a photograph for I don't know how many years now. You know, yeah. it's more to do with education. You know, like yeah. either by YouTube or with workshops or whatever. Mm. I mean, I'm seeing Raf in the chat, um, who I spoke to a few months ago from Iceland, and he was, I'm pretty sure, Raf, that you said something uh, on Facebook recently about making something like 0 0.03 pence from a from a <laughs> picture that was uh, purchased from one of these stock websites. You're right, it's, it's kind of thing back in the day, there was not many people doing it, you could maybe make something out of it, but... Uh, perhaps not so much. I mean, these days. Now, I mean, we obviously Adam uh, came to chat about a new case filter system. Nigel, yeah. I think, is <laughs> he's either forgotten the day or uh, he's stuck somewhere. But we're gonna we're gonna pretend Nigel's not gonna make. It. If he comes, uh, we can jump in. But apologies to those of you. Um, obviously, they're here to see me and you, Adam, and not Nigel at all. But um, we'll we'll chat about the uh, the new case system K W. Uh, revolution is what it's called um, and I gotta say kudos to Case for always coming up with very cool names uh, for the new systems but you've got I think uh, there Adam it's a magnetic circular system that is yeah. color coded look yeah there we go we can see that it's kind of like the Olympic rings I think it should come yeah. in those three and two yeah yes and uh, kudos to Case for coming up with um, that uh, I, that's what I quite admire about Case um, they they, they are quite, um, if you have a suggestion, uh, mm -hmm. they'll definitely uh, think about it and, and look into it. And uh, when they came out with the, was it, I think it was the Wolverine system, which was the first magnetic yeah. filters they came up with, I was pretty impressed with them. And I did a, a video on YouTube about them. But one of the things that kind of was a bit frustrating was that, of course, as I'm getting older, I have to start wearing glasses. And one of the frustrating things for me was that all the filters were black. And every time I went to pull one out of my bag, I'd be like squinting, trying to <laughs> or holding up, well, which yes. one is that? And so I made the suggestion actually to Andrew, uh, you, is it you? You. That Andrew, is you, yeah. In the UK and got him to ask Case if, they, if it would be possible if they would come up with a, uh, a colored system. I know some people use uh, like nail polish, um, mm. but I haven't. I, I Not everyone's got nail polish on hand. Yeah. And, and the other thing is I don't think, now I could be wrong here, but I don't think any other filter company had ever come up with a different color coding system. So anyway, they came up with it and it's great because I could just look at, like, I mean, obviously I can see the colors without my glasses on and just say, okay, well the silver, that's a CPL and just grab it. It's, it's pretty quick. And of course, being magnetic, um, that helps even more because mm -hmm. they're, they're on in like that in a flash. So, yeah, I'm impressed with them um, and the size and the how thin they are mm. and the quality of the glass. Um, 
Yeah, it's just speed. I mean, the whole magnetic system in general, it's just the, the ease and the speed compared to where you have to, you know, try and slot this thing in a thread and it kind of goes in the wrong one. Whereas these, you know, smack them on, color coded. I'm not entirely sure where case can go from here because they seem to have, a, I mean, any, any anything on your wish list that, uh, that hasn't perhaps happened yet is it's rock proof apparently i don't know did you manage to drop any when you're in antarctica there's nothing sitting at the bottom of the southern ocean <laughs> no. well i well it was funny actually when i first got these i i did drop one <laughs> I, I lost one i thought oh no i just i got i just got them and then um i was looking through my bag and it, it, it just happened to fall into the pocket on the outside of my bag so luckily i, I hadn't <laughs> lost it um but I, I, I mean, I don't know what else a, a filter company could come up with. I mean, they're filters, right? So, I mean, um, <laughs> they're thin. The glass is great. They're color coded. They're magnetic. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know what else. There it's might be, like might be someone out there with a suggestion in the chat. Suggest it's a case, like you said, they're always fantastic at um, uh, receiving suggestions and you know doing what they can with them. I mean, you obviously, Adam, shoot a lot of long exposures. I've seen, I was looking at some of your uh, work over the last few days, some, some really, really nice stuff, even with water that you might think would be kind of generally still anyway, the leaves, things like that. Uh, I mean, are, are the ND filters something that you carry a lot and use a lot? Um, I wouldn't say I use them a lot, but there are, there are definitely specific times when I do use them a lot. Like this last trip to Scotland, um, Harris and Lewis, uh, for, for, what, for whatever reason, I just find whenever I'm photographing the ocean or a, a body of water with not, not large uh, kind of forceful waves, but something where it's just kind of ripply, mm -hmm. I, I, I find it quite distracting to the other elements if I really want to simplify things. So that's when the ND start to come out. And I, I don't use them for every single photograph, but uh, they're, they're definitely handy to, to really smooth and sim simplify uh, a scene for sure. And on this last trip, I, I did, I used them a lot, especially the the 10 stop and the, uh, the, the 64. Um, yeah, I used them all the time. So they were very handy. And the CPL I use sparingly because um, sometimes I find if you block out all reflections and it kind of flattens the image out and I don't mm. want to totally flatten things out. So I'll just turn it a little bit and just get rid of a little bit of the glare, but not all of it because I, I kind of like that added glare for a bit of depth. That, that's quite unusual. A lot of people, I think, they you know they, they put the polarizer on and they just they they cut it out as much as they possibly can. I mean, have you got any? That's obviously a good tip for people starting out, starting out with filters for the first time. What's a kind of a you know a bit of wisdom that you've learnt for using them that you would you would pass on to someone to save them making maybe the same uh, you know not mistakes necessarily, but the stuff that you've learnt. Yeah, I I mean with the CPL, especially in forest photography, because I do a lot of that on the island here. Uh, your instinct is just to slap on a CPL and get rid of all the glare and saturate the colors. And it does that. It does a great job of that. But what I find is, is that that glare is what is adding a bit of depth to your photograph. So if you're not sure about it, then what, what I'll often do is take one or two images with a CPL, perhaps fully um, polarized. And then I'll take some that aren't polarized and uh, sometimes I'll combine those in layers in Photoshop because there might be certain areas in an in an image where you like the polarization, but other areas where you don't. So um, I'll just combine those in, in Photoshop. Mm. It's very subtle. Um, you know, like uh, things like leaves and ferns, they often have a lot of uh, glare in them. And if you take that all out, then all of a sudden those leaves just kind of blend in with the background so it's nice to have a bit of glare in there so that it adds that depth that you're you're looking for yeah so woodland photography is perhaps if for again somebody starting out not something they might associate with a polarizer you know you tend to think you know rivers, <clears throat> whatever take the glare off i mean is that something that um you would always recommend people to take it with them just experiment and see what happens yeah definitely um yeah definitely woodland forest photography um the, the grand landscape, I, I don't use a CPL that often, especially with wide angles, because you get the 
you know, you'll get the blotchiness, you'll get one area of the sky that's dark and another mm -hmm. area that's not. And I mean, you can get around that. You can take one with a blotch over here and one with a blotch over here and then combine them again. But that's a, an added step that you might want to, might not want to take in, in Photoshop. Um, but yes, mostly in woodland photography and when I'm photographing waterfalls, I'll use a CPL a lot because um, that's where the glare does kind of get in the way a little bit, especially when you mm -hmm. have a waterfall surrounded by rocks that have a lot of glare on them, then the, the glare can kind of take away from the main feature, which is usually the waterfall. So it's very handy for that as well. Mm. So if we're talking about Photoshop, you're obviously speaking about combining images, things like that. You've obviously got no problem doing that. What's your kind of your general, um, you know, take on when it comes to editing? Do you like to keep things minimal or do you quite enjoy getting in there and, you know, stacking and things like that? Um, I, I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with, um, with Photoshop and, and uh, editing images. Um, I try personally, I, I try to keep things as real as possible. Um, I'm not into combining, uh, you know, different images from a different place or changing the skies out or, um, doing these composites of, of different mm -hmm. images. That's not really my thing. Um, I do like to try and uh, portray an area as truthful as, as possible. Generally, when I use layers in Photoshop on that, it's because of the technical uh, kind of disadvantage of the camera. Say I'm photographing a waterfall and I want the shutter speed to be a quarter of a second, but there's all this foliage around it that's moving. Well, obviously, at a quarter of a second, all that foliage is going to be quite blurry. So then I'll take another photograph of, with a faster shutter speed and then combine those images. And that's when I generally combine photographs. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, I, I try to like to keep things relatively real and real looking, if, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, and use Photoshop to get the truth of what you saw at the time. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a true believer of that. I mean, I, I figure, well, if you're getting up at some ridiculous hour in the morning mm -hmm. to record that beautiful light, then, um, you know, if you're just going to do it in Photoshop and combine all those things, then why would you bother? Why not just get a bunch of stock images and, and combine them all? <laughs> in know? the first place, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Adam, we were chatting earlier. Obviously, you've been up to Scotland recently. You've been out in the uh, in the west, uh, the west Coast Islands. You've been to Antarctica this year. Do you have any uh, plans for 2024? Anything exciting coming up on your radar? Well, 2023... Oh, sorry, that, yeah, that one as well. <laughs> I'm well ahead uh, of myself. Yes, actually, um, yeah, this year is going to be a, a lot of traveling. Um, so mid-January, I'm heading to Spain um, for three weeks. Um, my, my good friend, Alistair Ben, is running a workshop there. So I'm just tagging along um, just because I, I'll get him to show me around all these great places. Mm. And then the second half of the trip, we're doing a, a combined workshop in Spain. And then in um, March, I'm flying out to um, Drakensberg in South Africa with a photographer, Alex Nail. Um, but I'm, I'm going as a client. So I've, I'm just paying Alex um, with his regular clients to take me up into the Drakensberg. Mm -hmm. I watched... Um, uh, Alex's uh, videos he's made several videos of Drakensberg and it, it looks absolutely fantastic up there and I wanted to do it before I get too old um, so I, you know, cause I, many decades yeah <laughs> well you know I mean backpacking I mean I enjoy backpacking um, but you know you get to a point where you just don't might want I might not want to do it anymore so I figured well I should do it now while I still mm. can so it's a backpacking trip and my partner, Karen, she's coming with me. So it's kind of a, a it's a holiday yes. photography mm -hmm. trip and hopefully I'll do a bit of vlogging while I'm there. So, and be Actually, guided, guided yeah. around. You do have a YouTube channel, I should mention as well, just in terms of if people want to find out more about your work. I was saying earlier, you've got some beautiful galleries online. I mean, shapes just, just standing out everywhere. I really enjoyed looking um, okay. at your work, but your YouTube channel as well, Adam, just remind us what that is. People can find you if they want to. Uh, it's Adam Gibbs photography. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. <laughs> just Adam Gibbs. Luke you might, Adam there's, a, there's a voice actor who does anime. His name's Adam Gibbs. And there's <laughs> so another, that's not you. There's another actor, Adam Gibbs. I'm not an actor. I just run a YouTube channel and it's 
basically me just in the field talking about my photography and give a tip here and there and yeah it's a lot of fun i really enjoy yeah. it and then your website as well obviously adamgibbs.com i think is yeah. what that is but anyway google google adam if you want to find out more uh, about his work about vancouver island as well some of the lovely spaces around there and all his travels uh, out and about but we're going to leave that there for now it's just about uh, half an hour and thank you so much to everybody who joined us tonight to talk about uh, Adam and uh, theoretically Nigel, who's, who's, who's yeah, not made it in you. yet. <laughs> we'll maybe do another one with Nigel at some stage, but um, hopefully you found that useful and you found some useful stuff about the new uh, case filter system. If you do want more information, like I said, do feel free to drop an email to the team at Case. They're absolutely fantastic, either uh, the Case UK team or wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, there's teams all over the world, so hop online. And uh, you can check that out. This will be available if you do want to share it or watch it again uh, you can do that here on the case uh, filters socials youtube channel that should be available in just a few moments time once we hang up i don't think that's the correct term for streaming uh but whatever the correct streaming version is but anyway thank you so much for joining us adam thank you so much um yeah, as well it's been good to good to get to know you and uh yeah have a good uh, rest of your day evening whatever it is and uh, craig i will say hi craig's been in the chat saying hi all the way through and uh okay. yeah nice to see you anyway <laughs> good night bye